Convent Drive is a road that is off James Gishuru Road. You know, the Lovington area, Lovington Green. Those who know the area well will know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, as I was growing up, whenever we used to pass that area, driving along James Gishuru Road, uh, in my dad's old ramshackle car. <laughs> and it was very predictable, and I'd wait for it, yeah? Immediately we got uh, within a few meters of Convent Drive, he would say, uh, son, that is uh, Tom Boyer's house, okay? The late Tom Boyer's house, okay? Till it stuck in my head, even long before I knew who this man Tom Boyer was, yes? Now, this is the scene where we're going to start this amazing story about one of the truly great giants of Kenyan politics and Kenyan history. Yes, a man called Thomas Joseph Odiambo Boyer, or simply known as Tom Boyer. Now, our story starts on an evening in 1969, early in the, early in the year. Now, everybody knew 1969 was going to be an election year. Okay, and normally during election years, in fact, starting from the year before, the government prepares very well for elections, even in those days when there was no serious multi party politics. Why? Because the government always wants control, and indeed, this is the same problem we have today. Uh, it is believed in Kenya, unless you have complete control over everything, then you're not a government. Yeah, this is the old thinking. Okay, anyway. So the government normally starts preparing very, very early for elections, and this was early 1969. So let us zoom in into Tom Boyer's residence along Convent Drive. Yes, the time was uh, a few minutes to 7 p.m. It was just starting to get dark, and a call came through from the gate. Of course, uh, Tom Boyer was a cabinet minister. He was the minister for economic planning, and he was also the member of parliament for Kamkunji, Nairobi. Okay, and uh, so a call came in through from the gate to the main house. Uh, you know, of course, the gate was being guarded by an administration policemen. One of the administration policemen put through the call and said that there was somebody who wanted to see the minister, and they had insisted that it was urgent. And could the minister please come to the gate? Now, he really insisted that the minister come out because uh, the person had a very urgent message, it was a kind of emergency. So you should, uh, please, sir, uh, just come out immediately, something like that, yeah? Mboya declined, and instead he sent a relative to go to the gate and find out uh, who, the, who this was who wanted to see uh, the minister. Now I need to explain something. Mboya alikuwa mtu wa watu, yeah? He was a man of the people, okay? He would talk to anybody, he had contacts with the most amazing, uh, low-class, down-and-out people, you'd just be amazed. He was a man of the people, well loved by everybody. Yeah? He did not have uh, this thing of I'm a minister and therefore there should be a certain protocol and so on. So somebody turning up at his gate and asking him to see, asking to see him was not very strange. Yeah? Uh, of course today it would be very strange. Of course with a lot of our ministers it would be extremely strange, especially our very proud uh, uh, CSS cabinet secretaries. Yeah? They would say, Ay, nani ya nataka kuona CS kwa gate? Hey, make him, tell him to book an appointment in the office. And you know, they'd get very annoyed and very upset that anybody would even come to their residence. Boya was not like that. Yeah? So Boya send, sends his uh, relative to the gate to check uh, what's happening. Now as the relative comes out, Kumbe, the administration policeman, is walking from the gate to the main house. Yeah? And uh, before anybody knows what's happening, he opens fire. Yes? Now apparently as a relative had come out, Boy had also changed his mind and was uh, right behind his relative and started coming out of the house when the, f when the shots were fired by the AP. A bullet missed Boya's chest by a whisker, by inches, okay? His relative dived under a car, Boya ran back inside the house. Failed assassination attempt, yeah? The administration policeman quickly disappeared in the darkness, okay? The man was arrested three days later, the administration policeman, but uh, something very strange happened. He wasn't charged for attempted murder or attempting to assassinate a cabinet minister. Instead, he was charged with uh, a much lesser offense of willfully damaging uh, Mboya's car. 
Yeah, apparently two of the bullets, he had fired several bullets, two of them had uh, lodged into the minister's uh, Mercedes uh, car. <laughs> Can you imagine that? In fact, that AP was jailed only for six months. Yeah? Oh, oh boy. Now, the fact that this AP got off so lightly uh, pointed directly at the government or somebody in government as being behind this assassination attempt. Okay? Even more ludicrous was the excuse the AP gave. He said uh, he had drunk a little too much. <laughs> so under the influence of uh, alcohol, this man had taken careful aim at a cabinet minister of the Republic of Kenya. What? Now in the previous uh, episode, we saw how uh, Pio Gama Pinto was uh, assassinated. Yes, somebody was used, paid, yeah, 7,000 bob uh, to shoot the man. Yeah. Now here's another incident where we're seeing uh, an AP must have been paid handsomely to do the job. Yes, and given all kinds of assurances. Yeah. Some of those assurances which uh, whoever had uh, given him the job stood by because he was only jailed for six months. He was never charged with attempted uh, murder, which was a much more serious uh, offense. Yeah. And so that's how impunity used to work in those days. But let us back up a little. Who was this man Tom Boyer? Yeah? Why were people so determined to kill him? Yeah? What, what was it about this guy? Okay? So let's just do a quick background so that we understand exactly what's going on here. Tom Boyer was the son of a poor uh, Sisal uh, worker. Yeah? And he was born in a place called Kilimambogo. Kilimambogo is very close to Thika. Yeah? Thika of that area. Okay? And he was born very far away from where his dad, uh, where his parents originally came from. They originally came from Rusinga Island. Now, something else interesting I need to mention, uh, the people of Rusinga Island are not really Luos, yeah? They're, they're called Luos, but technically, they belong to the Suba. Yeah, the Subas are in fact Bantus. And they are, you know, as you all know, the Luos are nylons, yeah? And in fact, uh, for many years, the Luos have considered the Suba not pure. Uh, Luos. <laughs> but that is a story for another day. Okay? Now, just to bring it into perspective, maybe briefly, uh, the late Otieno Kajuang, uh, cabinet minister, was uh, from the Suba area. Uh, the current uh, Suba North uh, member of parliament elect, very famous Milia Diambo, is also a Suba. Okay? So that, that's really what it is. That's where Mboya came from, Rusinga Island. Now, intelligence and gifting, sio masomo, yes, because we have this disease in Kenya nowadays where we believe unless you're very, very learned, you're an idiot. <laughs> Tombo is a perfect example. From those humble beginnings and with very limited education, yeah, you reach the equivalent of uh, what you'd call Form 2 in the old system, not even Form 2 in 844. Maybe the equivalent of Standard 8 in the 844 system, yes, he had very basic uh, education. But he was a voracious reader, he was very intelligent, yes, a very, very gifted person, yeah. One of the politicians that uh, stands out like a huge giant in Kenyan history, yeah. And one of the great, great heroes of Kenya who has fallen, yeah, in their fight against impunity in our country. Now, if you want to learn more about Tomboya, there's plenty of material on the man in this channel. Just go to the search uh, tools, uh, type in Tomboya, and you'll get a lot of background uh, videos that I've done on this man's uh, background and so on and so forth. Because I want us to drive straight, uh, I want us to dive straight into the politics. Now, Mboya was the main architect of our independence, yes, and he did this by negotiations, yeah. Now, I know there's a story which goes around Kenya, and uh, I believe it's even in our history books, that Kenyan independence was gained by violent uh, struggle. <laughs> Go tell that to the birds, yeah? Or as somebody told me to say it in Kiswahili, Kwendo wambi endege you. The truth is that uh, the violent struggle contributed, yes, because it attracted attention to Kenya, yes, and uh, that's about it. Because what happened by 1952, the Mau Mau had been completely defeated. Their leader, hero Dedan Kimathi, had been captured and hanged at Kamiti prison. Yes. Uh, the colonial government was in full control again of the country. Yes. And there was no uh, opposition to speak of. Okay. 
if they had uh, quelled that struggle and it was just a done deal, it was done. Yeah, there was nobody who'd raise the head again uh, against the mighty colonial government. Along comes Tomboya, and uh, using uh, the contacts he had outside the country, the contacts he was able to get through the Koto movement, you know, he was in the trade union and so on and so forth, and using his intelligence and his networking skills, he was able to get. Uh, Kenyans or local Kenyans, indigenous Kenyans, onto the negotiation table with the colonial government for independence. Now his strategy was very interesting. What they do, they sit down, negotiate for something, and then even before the ink dried on the arrangement, on the agreement, it was already on to the next demand. Yeah, and uh, it went on like that until we got independence. That's really, I'm really trying to summarize it. Okay. Now, of course, the first major breakthrough in Boyer's negotiations, yes, along with others was uh, what happened in 1958 when we had the first uh, eight African elected uh, leaders. Among those leaders were people like Masinde Muliro, Daniel Toretti Charap Moy, yeah, those are the only names that would make sense, yes, and of course Tom Boyer who represented Nairobi. Now Boyer's election in Nairobi was very interesting because one of his uh, opponents was a man called Munyo Ayaki from a very famous uh, family and a member of the House of Mumbi, Akikuyu, yeah? And uh, Mboya had no problem defeating him uh, in those elections of 1958 for the Nairobi seat. Yeah, the only eight seats for Africans uh, countrywide, yeah? Now, just a minute, the other person, prominent person in the list of first eight African elected members was uh, Jaromogi Oginga Odinga, father to Raila Odinga, yeah? Who rep represented the Nyanza, I think Nyanza North, okay? As I said earlier on, there's plenty of material on Boya where you can read the details because I'm trying to go very fast. Um, but the long and short of it was that Boya was the brains behind the eight African elected members uh, at that time. Yes, he fostered unity even where there was no <laughs> there was no uh, incentive for unity because the other all the other African leaders, especially one Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, felt that Boya was a young man in too much of a hurry. <laughs> Mboya was only 28 years old, and Jaramogi Oginga Odinga was 47, yes, uh, in 1958 when both were elected. So you can see the, the difference in age, and uh, uh, the, the older Jaramogi felt that this younger man should uh, give him some more respect. And yet Mboya was very impatient, yeah, he was a man in a big hurry, very intelligent, very brilliant, uh, at times a bit arrogant, yes, especially to people who he felt uh, were taking too long. To understand where he was going. <laughs> Actually, the rivalry between Jaramogi Oginga Odinga and Tom Boyer started in 1958 from their first meeting in Nairobi as the first black African elected members. Okay? So let's dive into the politics here. Yeah? Now, Kenya is hurtling towards independence. Yes. The year is 1960. Okay? Due to Mboya's uh, very skillful negotiation skills. And of course, he had a lot of support from his American friends. We'll, we're going to go a bit deeper into that <laughs> later in this uh, uh, series. Yeah, but for now, let's just call them American friends. Kenya was on course for independence. And the two front runners to be the first leader, the first presidents of uh, the Republic of Kenya, were, of course, Jaramogi Oginga Odinga and uh, Tom Boyer. Yes, and many people felt that. Uh, because Tom Boy always seemed to outsmart uh, uh, Jaram the older Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, yeah? they felt that uh, nothing could stop Tom Boyer from being the first president. Okay? And then, drama. The kind of drama that changes destiny, the kind of drama that changes history. Okay? Now, I remember uh, growing up, one of the things my dad always used to say, he used to say, if Mboya had become the first president of Kenya, Kenya would have been a very different country, okay? We would be way ahead. And a lot of the problems we have faced, we would not face, okay? Now, looking at the Kenya of today and the kind of problems we have, I cannot help but agree with him fully, okay? Now, we'll go for a short break. Uh, when we come back, I will tell you some really amazing things of what happened next because there was plenty of drama, okay? as uh, we see why as we head towards the actual assassination of Mboya, who did it and why. Okay, so don't miss that. I'll be back shortly.
welcome back. Now in a ruthless political maneuver, Jaramogi Oginga Odinga stands up in parliament and uh, says we Kenyans are not ready for independence until Jomo Kenyatta is released. Now that sent shockwaves right across the house, yes, right across parliament. A lot of people are asking, Jomo who? Who is that? Yeah, he had been forgotten. Jomo, of course, had been jailed uh, in Kapenguria. Yeah, he was amongst the Kapenguria Six, accused uh, of being a member of Mau Mau, which was a false accusation, which came out later, yeah. But he had been forgotten, more or less forgotten. Now, one of the reasons why the, uh, you know, this is something which has never come out over the years, but uh, Jomo had a lot of enemies amongst the colonial government. And it's very interesting uh, the colonial government was not against uh, Jomo so much for his uh, radical politics, yes, because he was not even a radical politician. Jomo was a very, very soft moderate. In fact, this is what got him into problems with people like the Mau Mau, who believed such a soft approach to the mighty colonial government was not going to get any results. And maybe in a way they were right. <laughs> yeah, anyway. The main reason why the colonialists were very much, uh, why he had gotten so many enemies, was because of his traditional beliefs. Yeah, uh, Jomo believed in believed in those days in the circumcision of uh, females. Yeah, according to the Kikuyu custom, and a lot of other traditional practices that uh, the colonialists, the white man, the Mzungu, found detestable. They found disgusting. Okay, so <laughs> so that's that was one of his main uh, problems, the colonialists. Yeah. Anyway, this small speech in Parliament by Jaramogi Oginga Odinga really fixed his political enemy to Mboya, and this is how it fixed him. Mboya was representing, remember Nairobi. Yeah, the vast majority of voters in Nairobi were Kikuyu community. Okay, so if Mboya uh, stood up and opposed what uh, Jaramogi was saying and said that, oh no, that's not a priority, we should have independence, all political detainees will be released. What would have happened is that uh, he would have completely lost his uh, uh, voter base, yeah, his uh, base of voters in Nairobi, his key <laughs> eh, base uh, of people who voted for him year in, year out, whenever he stood for elections. So as usual, Mboya played smart. Suddenly, he became one of uh, the closest people to Jomo. Yes, he, he was the one, uh, at, uh, you know, he went to visit uh, um, Jomo almost immediately after that. Uh, got a lot of pictures taken and uh, coverage so that everybody knew that Mboya was a great friend to Kenyatta. Yeah, I tell you politics. <laughs> and this whole drama set off a chain of events that changed the situation, changed destiny for Kenya, so that uh, the first president of Kenya or, you know, of course he became Prime Minister first, was actually Jomo Kenyatta, a compromised candidate, a compromised candidate, yeah? The two front runners were out of the game, yeah? And uh, we had a compromised candidate. In other words, uh, Jaramogi had played a kamikaze card. <laughs> what is a kamikaze card? Uh, he had finished himself and finished his political enemy boy at the same time, yeah? And the person who gained was one, Jomo Kenyatta. Yes, folks, believe it or not, the presidency of the Republic of Kenya was handed over to Jomo Kenyatta on a silver platter. Yeah? And amazingly, up to this day, the presidency of Kenya has always been handed over to the winner on a silver platter. Yeah? Take the case of uh, um, Moi after Kenyatta. Yeah? Kenyatta passed on. Uh, Moi eased uh, into the presidency. Yeah, he just became president. He took over because he was vice president. And the constitution said the vice president uh, takes over as president. And he established himself and he remained and ruled Kenya for 24 years. Okay, of course I am aware of all the political problems uh, Moi had, all the threats and uh, whatever he had. But it was fairly easy for him. Yeah, don't you agree? Now next was uh, Moi Kibaki. Moi Kibaki, a man called uh, Raila Odinga, who was the son of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, stood up at Huru Park and said, Kibaki Tosha, there you, have, there you have it. Presidency handed over on a silver platter to Mwai Kibaki. Our current president, Huru Kenyatta, the same. Yeah. What happened is that Ruto did all the, well, Huru uh, campaigned very hard in 2002, but failed, he didn't make it. Mwai Kibaki won those elections. Now, in um, 2000, 
2013, uh, William Ruto did all the work. Yeah, he did all the machinations behind the background and so on using ICC, blah, blah, blah. Pop, president of Kenya. Yeah, very interesting about our history. Well, we'll wait and see how our next president makes it there. I hope it will not be in the same manner. But as they say, history always repeats itself. Yeah, anyway, we shall see about that. Anyway, back to Mboya, our main topic. So coming into independence, Mboya did not really get uh, what he deserved. Yes, after all the hard work he did, the campaigning behind the background, the organization, the brilliance was not really rewarded. And uh, all he had to show for, for it was a spot, you know, a cabinet minister. Okay? And he was given the uh, cabinet post of uh, constitutional justice and constitutional affairs. Now, this was a strategic move by then Kanu because the whole idea was to, to dismantle the Lancaster House constitution. Yes, and uh, go for centralized, all-powerful uh, um, government, yeah, instead of the Majimbo, which was focused more on um, power to the Majimbos, the provinces, power to the provinces, and then with one central, uh, uh, less powerful uh, uh, government, okay? But the truth of the matter is that the Kenyatta administration feared Mboya, yeah? This man who had brought down the powerful colonial government who had, uh, who had outmaneuvered and, how, and uh, how, uh, uh, outsmarted the colonial government, even with his limited educational background, yeah, was a man they really feared. Okay? And so even going into independence, he was really a marked man. Yeah? Because it was obvious to the Kenyatta administration that this was the man who was just a president in waiting. Yeah? That's the truth. So before we go to 1969, which is where we started this amazing story on Tom Boyer, yeah, uh, let's quickly tie up something that happened uh, in 1966, okay? Now, now there's a very interesting political situation here, okay? We've already seen that Mboya and uh, Jaramogi were very, um, they were very much political rivals, okay? But uh, this suited the Kenyatta government because what happened, they could, con they could very easily be able to control both because uh, they would use uh, Jaramogi to make sure that uh, Mboya remains in check, yes, because Jaramogi was very close to President Jomo Kenyatta, yes, because remember, Jomo Kenyatta really literally owed his presidency to uh, Jaramogi, yeah, he's the man who had called for his release, blah, 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 and so on, so they became very close, the two men, yeah, and Mboya was at the center of everything, yeah, but when Mboya outmaneuvered and completely finished Jaramogi politically, okay, he had a lot of help from uh, 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 the government of Kenyatta, yes, and there's a lot of foreign influence in it, yes, uh, I'll not go into that for now, yeah, because we're dealing on the Mboya character, okay, and there's another more important point I want to bring out, okay. Now, as long as the two of them were there, Mboya was safe, but as soon as he, has, he had uh, gotten rid of Jaramogi politically, he became exposed, he became a sitting duck, because now all Jomo, Jomo's government had to do was to deal with Mboya and they'd be home free, yeah? They'd, they'd have complete control and nobody would be able to say anything to them. Hakuna mtu angeza kualitea nyanyenye as they went about uh, grabbing land and corruption and all the kinds of funny things they were doing, yeah? So this is a mistake Mboya made because really, in retrospect, Mboya would have done everything in his power to keep his enemy uh, Jaramogi in play in order to, uh, you know, to keep himself uh, useful, yeah, and in order, <laughs> in order to remain indispensable. But immediately Jaramogi was out of the way, uh, Mboya was not required anymore, yeah. This is very interesting in politics. Sometimes in politics, it may not be a good idea to finish a political enemy, yeah, especially in a situation like this. Yeah, that's something very interesting that came out of this. Now, we, we are back in the year 1969, and uh, in the next episode, we're going to go deep into the politics of this year, which was an election year, and we're going to reveal an amazing secret, yeah, that I only discovered in a recording I made earlier in this uh, channel uh, a few months ago, yeah. I only unearthed after almost 15 years of research, yeah, I not only solved the Mboya assassination completely, why and how he was killed and who pulled the trigger, yeah, but I was also able to put it together uh, politically, yeah, so that you understand completely why he had to be killed, okay? So that's something to look forward to. Until then, this is Chris Kumekuja. Kenya Inchi.
Piano. 